Okay, we're going to talk about culinary herbs today. And um, I've been chatting with a few people here in the audience. So we'll just kind of zip right into it. Culinary herbs would be herbs that you use mostly for cooking. Uh, but they make excellent landscape plants. Uh, and they also um, make excellent um, container plants. So, oops. Okay, there's a number of different ways that you can grow herbs, and one of them is in a dedicated herb garden. A dedicated herb gardens, there's a number of really fabulous ones in this area. One of them is at the University of Washington Medicinal Herb Garden, and that is on the UW campus. If you visit on Sunday, you don't have to pay their huge exorbitant parking fees. And, uh, <laughs> but before you go, look up where it's at. And because there's always construction going on there and you'll just drive around and around and go, oh, there it is. So anyway, this is the medicinal herb garden. They have probably hundreds of different varieties of herbs. They're very well marked. Um, if you bring children with you, uh, don't let them taste because some of these medicinal herbs are, um, could be toxic in, you know, for small children. Uh, but they are just, this is a fabulous garden to visit and it's a great resource in this area. Another shot of that and it's just peppered with signs. It has the botanical name and the common name of each plant. This is Bastyr College uh, in uh, Juanita. And uh, they teach alternative medicine there. And their garden is organic. And they use the food that they grow in that garden uh, for their uh, cafeteria. And the uh, raised beds uh, grow a variety of medicinal herbs. And you can go in, park in their parking lot, and uh, go on a little self-guided tour. This was a number of years ago, and then I visited this last summer and went, wow, when did they build all those? Uh, but they still have the same raised beds. Um, there's usually, especially on the nice days, there's somebody out there, so if you have questions, there's somebody there that can just tell you about the herbs that they are growing. <coughs> a lot of really nice new beds, and as you can see, there's a lot of students and gardeners there. This is the Bellevue Urban Demonstration Garden by th that the Master Gardeners have in Bellevue. It's on 16th Street between 156th and 148th. Um, if you go on 156th, uh, State Patrol uh, office is there, and the speed limit goes from 25 to 35, and there's always somebody there. So just watch the speed in that area. <laughs> and this is their... Um, herb garden, and this one was put in, oh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, and the cottonwoods around it have grown up, and so it's shaded, so they've had to move some of the herbs to sunnier areas. And this is a couple of years ago, and as you can see, uh, there's lots of mint and a lot of sweet sicily. Those are herbs that um, tolerate more shade than the, the uh, run-of-the-mill culinary herbs do. This is their new herb bed here, and everything is marked uh, with descriptions of the different varieties that they use and that are available for, um, you can probably go in and maybe ask for a little taste every once in a while. And they have a <coughs> fall harvest festival usually in September, and they also have classes um, uh, every Saturday from I think 10.30 to noon. Uh, they'll be starting up again in February, so every Saturday you can uh, look on their website and uh, find out where, what uh, different uh, classes they have. But as you can see, these are raised beds, and this is in full sun. This is a demonstration garden in Pierce County, and this is their herb bed, also a raised bed uh, in full sun. This is Neely Soames House in Kent. Um, the master gardeners do the gardening there, and this is the herb garden very early in the spring. This is a little bit later in the spring. 
and it has it really does fill in and it's it's just really quite lovely uh, Neely Psalms um, is one of the pioneer families and the everything in the garden is geared to is um, all the plants there are plants that could have been grown when the house was built the you know 1910 1920 so it, it is a heritage garden this is the front of the garden I just thought I would show you this because they have a hundred year old wisteria vine there and it grows all the way around the front porch and it is really and truly stunning in uh, the early spring Oh, around Mother's Day, maybe a little bit later. So if you get a chance to get down there and see it, it is really quite gorgeous. Okay, if you're gonna be growing culinary herbs, most of us have gardens with stuff in them. And it's really kind of a nice idea to put the culinary herbs in with the rest of your plants. And I'm gonna show you some uses of culinary herbs as part of a mixed landscape. This is a pea patch in Bellevue, and I just happened to walk by and went, wow, that is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, she's got chives, and she's got sage, and she's got a few other herbs there, and got some iris and some poppies and all that sort of stuff, and it's just really, it's just a lovely bed. So you can certainly integrate your herbs in with uh, a very casual kind of kitchen garden type thing. This is lavender growing at the Bellevue Botanic Garden. It's, this isn't there anymore. <laughs> they have completely redone many areas of the Bellevue Botanic Garden and they have like a new visitor center there. So anyway, this isn't there anymore, but they did combine lavender with ornamental grasses. And I thought that was just really a lovely um, area and it looked just terrific. Uh, and it would be one that would be not not needing a whole lot of care, not a whole lot of watering during the summer. And it's just really, uh, really gorgeous. So. This is the Waterwise Garden at the uh, Bellevue Botanic Garden. And this has a variety of different herbs in here. Uh, lavender, sage, ladies mantle, chives. Um, I think they have some oregano in there too. So they have a lot of uh, herbs mixed in with their water-wise garden. Okay, this is the Center for Urban Horticulture, and it's at the University of Washington. Just look up Center for Urban Horticulture. They have a Soest garden, they have a courtyard garden, they have the Seattle Garden Club Fragrance Garden. So they have a, a lot of different gardens in there. Uh, it also is the home of the Elizabeth C. Miller Library, which is the largest uh, horticultural botanic gardening library west of the Mississippi and north of San Francisco. Uh, it is also a lending library. Um, they do loan some of their books out. Uh, so, and it's a fabulous resource for um, our area. This is one of their gardens, and this is when the lavender was in full, full bloom. Uh, and so they have combined it with a lot of different ornamentals and it looks fabulous. So if you kind of want to add uh, culinary herbs to your landscape, um, you can certainly do that in a way that is extremely attractive. This is Bradner Gardens Park. It's like a little pocket park. Um, it has a little picnic area, it has a playground, it has a demonstration garden, it has a pea patch, and it has a, a I did say playground. On the other side of this is a basketball court. And so this, is a, this area is herbs. And that, of course, a basketball is going to get away from the players from time to time. And the stuff is going to get trampled. And it just perks right back up. And it just doesn't really care. So um, it's also rocks on this side, um, concrete, and then blacktop. So it kind of bakes there all summer long. So it, they really are tough plants, and they still look really pretty darn good. Uh, this is a different view of that same area. Um, they have a tractor sunk into the concrete, and the kids can play on that. So yeah, this area gets a lot of traffic, a lot of activity, and the plants just do fine. 
This is woolly thyme used as a ground cover. So that is one solution to some um, uh, gardening uh, dilemmas of what you're going to put in an area. Uh, woolly thyme is kind of fuzzy. Um, it can certainly be used for culinary purposes, um, but it's not as flavorful as some of the other thymes. This is Corsican mint on the side. Um, <laughs> this is a tree peony on the other side. Um, it's my tree peony. It blooms around Mother's Day. If the weather is warm, the blooms last about two and a half days. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I have pictures of them, so I remember from year to year. Uh, but the Corsican mint makes a terrific ground cover uh, in a f uh, like a little bit of a shady area. And if your dog or cat walks on it, their feet smell like Crest toothpaste. Uh, but it is a very nice flat uh, ground cover. Really nice in between paving stones. Uh, this is thyme. It's a, um, I think the variety is pink dimity thyme. It's one of the shorter thymes. And it is growing um, next to a rockery. Or, and um, so it gets really good drainage. It gets full, full sun. Um, and it provides a nice clean edge for um, that area, and uh, if the garden uh, owner wants a little bit of time for in their stew or with their chicken soup, it is there. This is um, Iris Douglasii. This is Douglas's Iris, um, but it is growing with sweet woodruff. Sweet woodruff is one of the few plants that will actually grow under a western red cedar and it grows very nicely with your native plants. So uh, it's mostly used for potpourris. Um, it gets a little white flower on it. Um, you can uh, make uh, May wine with it, and you just dry a little, a couple of handfuls of sweet woodruff and uh, seep that in lemon juice and a bottle of Rhine wine and a little bit of Rhine wine and a little bit of sugar. And then uh, add another bottle of Rhine wine to it, maybe a little champagne, and um, make merry with it, I'm sure. So, certainly would lift the spirits and create a carefree atmosphere. So, it also makes a really terrific ground cover, so, for one of those really awkward areas. Herbs do extremely well in containers. Um, these are containers I've had a couple of years ago. I have decided in the meantime that I really can't handle lifting and moving around terracotta pots, so I have gone to plastic and uh, given my terracotta pots to my son and his wife, who <laughs> can still heft them around. Uh, but you can combine your herbs with ornamentals and uh, have them uh, right near the kitchen door. And if they get too big for the pots, you can just lift them out and plant them out in the garden. <clears throat> strawberry pots are really terrible things to grow strawberries in. But they are really good for growing herbs in. And the reason they're good for growing herbs in is they dry out really quick, and they're nice and warm, and you can like move them into a nice sunny spot. Uh, you can take the little tiny um, uh, pots of herbs and kind of slip those in as you're filling up your strawberry pot. And um, you can grow, oh, a half a dozen different kinds of herbs in a strawberry pot. So if you have one laying around that was unsuccessful for strawberries, this is how you're going to use it. <laughs> Another reason that you would want to put herbs in containers is um, they escape. And just confine your mint. Um, the mint family has hollow square stems. So any plant with a hollow square stem is suspect until, <laughs> until you uh, make sure that it isn't going to escape and take over your whole garden bed. So um, these are different kinds of mint growing in um, tiles. And it uh, looks really nice. And it keeps them from running all over the ground. They will uh, sometimes grow up and bend over a little bit, and if they touch the soil, uh, there's advantageous leaf nodes, um, advantageous roots that grow out of leaf nodes, um, and they will root in the soil and then take off from there. So kind of police the area a little bit to make sure that they don't escape on you. So. 
This is chocolate mint. Um, it does smell a little bit like chocolate. Um, it has a nice kind of reddish stem and a kind of dark green leaf. Um, and this is another way to confine a uh, plant that might get away from you, is just cut the bottom off of a grower pot, sink it in the soil, and plant your plant that could escape in that area, and it should do really well for you. Okay, um, herbs are generally pest resistant, with a few exceptions. Uh, this is a reminder <laughs> um, that if you're going to be growing um, edible plants throughout your landscape, is if you're going to be using any kind of pesticide, make sure that it's listed for edible plants. So you don't want to be using plants, a pesticide for an ornamental plant on an edible plant. So you can go the other way, but not... Um, uh, not using pesticides that are not listed for ornamental plants. Boy, I got a double negative in there. <coughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> um, that is the late, great Harvey Darvey. So, and uh, he was quite the um, mouser, and uh, he got the um, moles and voles and rodents. So he would leave me presents. Okay, they are generally pest resistant with deer. Um, except basil. <laughs> Deer love basil, so um, you will have to keep that up and away from them. Uh, <laughs> and since we no longer have a dog, we have had a group of deer kind of move in. They sleep in the backyard, and <laughs> which is really kind of cool, but that means I don't grow vegetables and anything that I value is up on the deck. So uh, <laughs> anyway, these guys were absolutely charming and so cute. Okay, slugs, yes. Uh, slugs are hermaphrodites, and so you only need two slugs. <laughs> you don't need a boy slug and a girl slug. Um, just two random slugs are fine. Uh, and they uh, mate in uh, like August and September, and they start laying eggs towards the end of September into October, and those eggs will keep growing throughout the winter um, at temperatures between like 35 and 45 degrees. So uh, if you find these, and they're about the size of seed pearls or um, bait, um, fish egg bait. Uh, so if you find these, you wanna like put them in salt water or soapy water or something to get rid of them because all of the, each of these is gonna hatch into a baby slug and they hatch hungry. This is a trap that they have used at the uh, Bellevue Demonstration Garden, and it has worked fabulously well. Uh, they put pieces of wood in between the lettuce, and underneath that wood, they use the iron phosphate slug bait, and it provides a kind of a little damp, cool, shady area, and the slugs go under there and go, oh, you left me a snack. Uh, and it's worked really well. I have never seen them have better looking uh, lettuce than they have had this last year. So. Okay, um, caffeine is a novel toxicant for slugs and snails. Uh, there was a study out of the University of Hawaii and they were using coffee um, as a uh, toxicant for snails that were eating their uh, I think they were growing orchids. And uh, so you could certainly use that um, if you just uh, type in caffeine as a novel toxicant for slugs and snails, that study will pop up and you can look at it. Um, but the best coffee to use is brewed coffee, drip coffee, rather than espresso because it has more caffeine in it. Um, and you can certainly spray that on the slugs um, or you can kind of water your plants with your leftover uh, coffee. So. <sighs> spit bugs, yes. Um, the spit stuff around there protects the little nymphs from uh, pesticides, so um, they n it's not real effective. This was my lavender. I was like 
uh, several years ago. So anyway, I went, whoa, and then I went in and grabbed my camera and took a picture of it. And then I just sprayed it down with a hose. Um, the nymphs can't fly yet. And so once you rinse them off the plants, they're done. Uh, so yeah, you can just rinse them off. And especially a plant that's fairly sturdy like lavender, um, a good blast with a hose is not going to hurt that at all. So you can just simply rinse it off with water and you're, you're good to go. This is bay leaf sucker. Okay. <laughs> and they only um, bother uh, Loris noblis, which is the culinary bay. And they kind of cause the leaves to curl up and they drip sticky on, uh, on the uh, leaves below it, the honeydew drips. Uh, and it's just, they're just sort of messy. And uh, those also can just be rinsed off with a hose. Uh, you could possibly use um, soapy water if you wanted to. Uh, but I find a hose works really well. And when my um, tree was like almost as tall as the house, uh, that really wasn't an alternative for me. But I did find out that the little, there's a little tiny bird that hangs around, and they really like these bugs. And so <laughs> as soon as I start seeing the bugs, I start hearing these little tiny birds and they make an incredible amount of noise and they really clean off my tree. So it's like, okay, win-win, everybody. Uh, but you will have some uh, kind of twisted leaves um, and it's not that bad. So you can certainly prune those right off. Um, this is my former bay tree and it did get, that's a two-story house and it did get that high. They are pretty hardy in this area, but was that three years ago we had a really awful winter and I ended up with bark splits and broken leaves and I tried to get it to limp along for a couple of years and this year we just finally took it out. One of the problems with the bay trees is they sucker, which for me now is a good thing um, because I can pick uh, bay leaves off the suckers now. So, uh, so. and they get a little tiny um, kind of creamy uh, yellow flowers on them. And you'll find little tiny um, kind of cherry type things. And sometimes they'll germinate and sometimes not. Um, I've had that, I had that tree for over 20 years and I only had a couple of seeds germinate. They're usually propagated from cuttings. And apparently they are fairly difficult to propagate, um, but you could certainly give that a try. Uh, with the little root tone and uh, do that like probably I think this time of the year would be a good time to try propagating um, bay laurel but uh, maybe and give that a try but just be aware that they're difficult to propagate and that's probably why they're as expensive as they are but they're not nearly as expensive as you know the jars that you buy of bay leaf so Okay, what's the difference between a spice and an herb? An herb is the leafy part, pretty much, and a spice is everything else. The seeds, the bark, the roots. So. Or in cilantro, it's both. Cilantro is the leafy part, coriander is the seed. So. Uh, it's a true annual. I was talking to somebody else here and uh, coriander or cilantro um, is a very fast cycling annual and it is a true annual. Annuals are plants that complete their growth from seed to seed within one growing season. And cilantro will probably do that within six weeks to two months. So you plant a cilantro seed, uh, at the time it comes up and goes to seed again, only a very short period of time has passed. Uh, so you would want to plant cilantro, if, you if you're growing your own cilantro, you're going to want to plant it about every two weeks during uh, the growing season. And it does have a little tap root, so it prefers not to be transplanted, so you can seed those directly. And cilantro is uh, very much available in the grocery stores. You can certainly buy cilantro, I think any grocery store at all, quite reasonably. Uh, but then you end up throwing away like a whole bunch of cilantro. So if you have a whole bunch of cilantro left over, what you can do is chop it up 
and smush it into an ice cube tray and fill that up with a little bit of water and then uh, pop those out and put them in a plastic bag and when you're making tacos or burritos or whatever just um, take it out and let it thaw out um, as you're cooking and then when you get to the end of cooking toss in the thawed out cilantro and I usually like to put in a little lime juice too to brighten up the flavors of whatever it is that I'm making and uh, you can certainly freeze lime juice or lemon juice too so you have two little cubes you're thawing out and just throw them in just towards the end of cooking um, and it would really brighten up the flavors and add a lot and also you're not throwing away or having cilantro turn into slime in the bottom of the um, crisper. Um, there's another way too and I'll show you that a little bit later. Okay, we've started at cilantro and we're going to move on to basil. And yes, you can freeze other leafy herbs, but not basil. Basil turns black at about 40 degrees. So when you go and buy one of those little packages for four bucks and you put it in the refrigerator and you get ready to use it and you go, whoa, it turned black. Um, <laughs> it just, um, basil just turns black at 40 degrees. It's a very, very tender plant. Uh, and the very back of my handout has directions for growing basil. Uh, it won't germinate until soil temperatures are between 65 and 70 degrees. And around here, if you want to seed it directly, that's going to be like July. Uh, so, so you would want to start it earlier indoors. And it could be, you could start it like on top of the refrigerator, um, in, in, on a, a mat that heats or in a heated greenhouse but it is not going to it's just going to sit there and sulk until the temperature soil temperatures are between 65 and 70. So you kind of want to time that so you have plants that are ready to go out when the soil temperatures are warmer and you really don't want to buy and I know they're available in all of the in the stores uh, starts uh, in March it's not going to be happy basil. You're going to need to keep it indoors. Okay, uh, very prone to stem rot, so avoid overwatering it. And you don't want it to dry out either. It is kind of a prima donna for trying to grow it. Uh, the slugs like it, the bunnies like it, the deer like it. I think probably the possums and the raccoons like it too. So um, <laughs> you need to put it someplace where you don't have that much competition. Okay, the best of growing conditions, not too wet, not too dry, full sun, warm soil. So uh, pamper it along as much as possible. This is the <laughs> capital in Madison, Wisconsin, and they have eight of these flower beds, and they're absolutely huge. And this one, the center sections here are all basil. So they, um, <laughs> and each of, the gardener get, each of the gardeners gets one of these huge beds and there's sort of a competition as to who can have the best annual bed there. Um, but this one had basil and um, yeah, it was just really pretty extraordinary. I went, wow. Okay, there, there are dozens of different varieties of basil. Uh, and if you wanna grow a lot of different varieties of basil, you're probably gonna have to grow it from seed. So uh, territorial seed has a good selection of seeds and they're out of Oregon and I think they're out of Portland, Oregon and they, hmm? They're in Eugene. Are they in Eugene? Thank you. Uh, but anyway, they grow, they're out of Eugene and they grow seeds and have seeds for the wet side of the mountains. So their varieties of vegetables uh, and herbs grow well for us here rather than you know, the big national brands that have seeds that grow really well in the Midwest. So. Uh, the leaves turn black at 40 degrees, um, but if you get really fresh basil at the farmer's market, or if your son grows basil and he cuts some off for you, um, you can keep it fresh in a glass of water like a bouquet um, and just remove the leaves on the way up. Use those leaves first and uh, just trim it off a little bit, change the water every couple days, and eventually it will root. <laughs> and you can plant those out if you want to. Um, but it keeps very well, it can keep, you know, up to two weeks or so in a um, 
just in a, in a glass jar on your um, windowsill and works really well uh, if you buy just you know some basil at the farmers market or you get it from somebody that's growing it you, it needs to be cut very fresh the stuff that's been laying around the grocery store for however long it's been laying around is probably dead 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 and it certainly isn't going to root or suck up any water dill <coughs> Uh, dill is one of the few plants or herbs that will grow in a kind of a moist area and sort of semi-shade. It also has a taproot like cilantro, so it wants to be direct seeded. It does not want to be started in a container and then planted on. Uh, and you can use um, the, just the seed heads. You can use the, just the ferny leaves. Uh, they're terrific in... Uh, cucumber salad, a dill, uh, dill with um, sour cream or a mayonnaise sauce for um, salmon is uh, really terrific. Uh, and you can use just about any part of the uh, dill plant. Parsley. It's a biennial. So what that means is in the s first year it grows um, a little rosette lots of leaves. The second year, it sends up this kind of weird seed stalk, and that flowers. So it's going seed to seed to growing seasons. So that's what a biennial is. And if you let it go to seed uh, for two years in a row, you will always have plenty of parsley. So, uh, parsley pretty much stays evergreen unless we have a really, really cold winter. So you can certainly leave that out in your... Um, container or in the ground. Uh, it's always nice to have a little bit of parsley. And if you um, have like dried herbs um, and you chop your parsley, sprinkle your dried herbs in there and kind of run the knife through there again. And that will kind of liven up the flavor of the dried herbs. So it's nice to have some parsley. Um, you can keep that nicely in a glass of water um, and you can put that in the refrigerator keep that a little bit longer. How can a man grow old who has sage in his garden? Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of sage. Um, the bicolor uh, with the, the golden and green, the solid green, uh, the tricolor green and red and white, and then there's a purple sage, can be used interchangeably. Uh, they tend to kind of get ki a little bit rangy and kind of woody. Uh, and when they get ugly, just take them out and put a new one in. So, <coughs> okay, next. Okay, this is Burggarten. It's a newer variety of sage, and it has a really big leaf on it, uh, slightly milder flavor. If you're going to be using fresh sage, it has a kind of a citrusy, uh, fresh flavor. It is not anything at all like dried sage. So you might want to have a little bit of dried sage on hand for your turkey stuffing uh, for that traditional flavor. Um, but the fresh um, sage has just a wonderful flavor and you can use it in biscuits, you can use it with scrambled eggs, you can use it on a little cottage cheese. But certainly experiment with it because it has um, a really nice flavor that I think you'll enjoy if you, if you give it a chance. So, next. Um, this is Burggarten in a container with parsley and um, a geranium. So, it really is a very pretty plant. Okay. Oh, rosemary. Um, <laughs> okay, there's a, also a lot of different kinds of rosemary. Upright rosemary, uh, can uh, most of those varieties can get to be like six feet tall um, and they're very woody. Uh, they do, they want full, full sun, not very much water. Uh, the very I've, most fabulous rosemary I've seen was growing in a parking lot between the asphalt and a drop off <laughs> with a cement uh, retaining wall. And I don't think anybody ever watered this, and it was just fabulous. It was tall and flowering and gorgeous. So a lot of, um, it'll take a lot of neglect. Um, I like pr 
the uh, trailing rosemary because the uh, needles on it are a little bit softer. They're a little bit easier to chop. And if you're going to be using rosemary like in soup or something like that, um, you need to take it off the stem and chop it. Otherwise, if you throw the stem in, the little needles fall off and you end up picking them out of your soup and ask me how I found that one out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I do like the trailing rosemary a little bit better, but it is not as hardy. Oh, this is trailing rosemary growing over a, rock over a rockery and a it's Wygelia above it, trailing rosemary and then Kinnick Kinnick, Arctostaphylus ursa uva. So. <laughs> Some of them just kind of fall off your tongue, and other ones you go, oh. Um, thyme. Lots of different kinds of thyme. Um, there's a, a thyme that has a lemon flavor to it, a lime flavor, a cinnamon flavor to it, uh, French thyme, uh, all different kinds of thyme. So um, just, uh, I think you can get a good idea of what it's going to um, taste like by getting a, a, the scent of it. And you can certainly dry um, thyme. And when you go to use it fresh, just pull it right, pull the little tiny leaves right off the stem and then drop them in whatever you're going to use them in. So this is a bed with probably a half a dozen different kinds of thyme in it. And it also has some saxifrage in there, which is um, those kind of fleshy looking star shaped plants. And next, winter savory. Um, it's actually used to flavor bologna and salami. Um, it has kind of a different flavor. It's good in chicken soup. Uh, it is <coughs> not that common. It's like the bean, uh, and they also use it as the bean herb. It's supposed to prevent flatulence after you have like bean soup or something like that. Uh, so uh, it is an interesting herb and something that you might want to try. It does make, um, a, it can be used uh, like for a knot garden because it's a very low growing shrubby plant. So if you want something like a little edging around a garden bed, that would be one of the plants you would want to use. So next, marjoram. It's a type of oregano. It comes in uh, golden. And it also comes in a two-colored, a yellow, I mean a white and green, and then solid green marjoram. It's a very mild flavor. Uh, one of the first cookbooks I had said, when in doubt, doubt use marjoram. So um, it's a good one to have around. It's attractive. So next. Oregano. Um, it's another one that will escape on you. There's Greek and Turkish oregano. It's a member of the mint family. What did I tell you about mint? Keep it contained. Square hollow stem. Uh, keep that contained. Uh, poor soil, drought, harsh sun, high temperatures, and freezing cold. It will take deal with all of those. So, um, yeah, and it really is a nice looking plant. You have to keep it pruned back. Okay, sweet Sicily. Uh, it has an anise or licorice flavor, and I think a lot of herbs have that kind of anise or licorice flavor. Tarragon does, basil does. Um, so that would be one that you could use um, instead of those. Okay, and this, it also is one of the few that grows in shade. So this is uh, at Neely Soames' house. They have this huge grape arbor, and the sweet Sicily is growing underneath it. Lemon balm. <coughs> Anybody grown lemon balm? You didn't let it go to seed, did you? I did once. You did once, okay. He said he let it go to seed once. So did I. <laughs> uh, this is when you would have little lemon balm seeds all over the place. So um, as soon as it shows sign of flowering, cut that guy off and throw it in the compost. You'll have really good smelling compost, um, and you won't have little tiny uh, lemon balm uh, plants all over the place. The next one is lemon verbena. I don't know if you remember from Gone with the Wind, but l verbena was um, Scarlett O'Hara's mother's favorite scent. Uh, it is probably the best of all the lemon scented herbs, and this is the only one on here besides basil that is not hardy in this area. 
that I talk about. Uh, it's Hardy to zone nine. We are zone eight. Uh, so we get down into the 20s or 30s, We're down into about 20 degrees on a typical winter. So um, it is deciduous. Uh, and the leaves on them are a little bit leathery. So you'd want to chop them up really fine or dry them and then crumble them. So this is one, if you can find it, is really great. Cat mint. Um, it's used for teas. Uh, and this is like six hills cat mint. And it's the most um, ornamental of the cat mints. Now there is cat nip, which is the next one. OK, this is, yeah, this is the cat mint in that same area where they, at the Bellevue Botanic Garden, uh, in that same area with the ornamental grasses. And that also looks really great there. So um, this is cat nip, and it has the um, pale pink flowers on it rather than the blue flowers. Uh, and this is the good stuff. Uh, and you can tell it by Nepeta cataria is the name of it. So cataria is the one you want for your feline friends, except <laughs> keep it covered until it grows up because I bought the Harvey Darvey, his own catnip plant, and he ate the whole thing in one day. <laughs> so <laughs> that is the end of the catnip plant. And then he slept for, I think, two days straight. So. Chives, um, mild onion flavor. Um, this is very hearty. Uh, you can chop this and use it in baked potatoes or in salads. Um, you can certainly take the little um, flowers off and sprinkle them on top of a salad. It looks really nice if you slice um, yellow tomatoes and then sprinkle purple chive flor florets on top of it. It's a, really a Martha Stewart moment. OK, flowers are edible. Um, and this is another thing you can do with um, your leafy herbs, is um, make a little bundle of them in the bottom of a Ziploc bag and freeze it. And you want to bundle them up really, really tight, put a rubber band around them to hold them in shape until they're frozen. Then you can take them out and chop them with a really sharp knife. And they thaw out beautifully that way. You can do that with parsley. You can do that with cilantro. Um, and you can do that with chives. And so yeah, it works great. Sweet Sicily, too, uh, if you want that flavor. Everything except basil, the leafy herbs. Um, this is garlic chives. It's not as purpley a pink flower. Usually they're white, but this one is light pink. And the leaves on the garlic chives are flat ish, <laughs> flatter, not the tubular um, leaves like on uh, the regular onion chives. So. OK, garlic. Uh, you can grow garlic in this area very well. And uh, you would plant that this time of the year, the same time you're planting your bulbs. And there is a um, uh, King County Master Gardener fact sheet on growing garlic that has all the information on growing garlic. But basically, um, plant it this time of the year. When it comes up in the spring, um, you know, let it keep growing. And around July, it's going to start looking sort of peaked and then fall over. And that's when you harvest it. So the next slide shows uh, garlic after it's harvested. And so you would hang that to dry. And then once it's dry, you can like braid the stems if you want to, or just cut them off. And they should hold pretty well for um, the, the winter if you grow quite a bit of garlic. If you um, buy a big old bag of peeled garlic, <laughs> you cannot freeze it just raw. You have to cook it. So uh, frying pan, a little um, kind of salad oil, a neutral flavored oil, if you want to use it for a, a lot of different purposes. Uh, and then slap a lid on that, low heat, and let that um, kind of fry or saute until they're kind of um, a little golden brown. And um, then you can freeze them. And there's just enough oil in there so they break apart easily. So when you're ready to make a stew or a gravy or mashed potatoes or something, you can break off 
um, part of that frozen cooked garlic and toss it in. Works great. Lavender, um, this is the Spanish lavender and it has like the little bunny ears on the flowers. These flowers are not as fragrant as um, the Augustifolia or, or the Latifolia is, uh, but the foliage on it is very fragrant and it's a very attractive plant. So next slide is um, Lavender Augustifolia is English lavender. Latifolia is the spike lavender. And the intermedia is a cross between those two varieties, but there are a lot of different varieties of lavender. And I have some information on the back of your handout. There are many different kinds of lavender, uh, some that are quite small, and then there's grosso that's five feet across. So you need to know what it is that you're getting um, in order to make sure that you have enough room for it. So one of the real problems with lavender is pruning them. Um, I was at a talk by the owner of um, Purple Haze Lavender Ranch, and he was talking about them pruning their lavender down to what he called turtles. So obviously I have never pruned my lavender down enough. <laughs> he said um, about two inches of green left on the lavender when you prune it. And that will keep, in theory, keep it from falling apart. This is what happens if you don't prune your lavender, but I have sort of had this theory that I think some of them fall apart more than others do, because I've had people say, I never prune my lavender, and it's as, as thick and well-shaped as it's ever been. So um, I'm not sure. So I would check maybe some of the um, public gardens and see what f varieties that they're growing, and whether theirs stay all together or fall apart and maybe pick accordingly, because there are a lot of different kinds of lavender. And once it starts falling apart, you can't prune into the woody part. So you pretty much have to get rid of that lavender and put a new one in. And luckily, they're not very expensive. So lavender is going to want full sun and really good drainage. Uh, the deer don't eat it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, and along with the other culinary herbs, um, sage, or the culinary woody herbs, uh, sage, uh, lavender, uh, rosemary, the deer don't eat those. Uh, they don't eat thyme. They pretty much leave um, oregano alone. Uh, and they haven't gotten into the parsley yet, but early days yet for that. Um, this is a properly pruned lavender that is um, just starting to grow in the spring. Okay, next. Uh, view from Purple Haze Lavender Ranch uh, during uh, the Lavender Festival. And that's another shot of Purple Haze Lavender Ranch.